I'm sure you have um, all donated either love or money by now, but if you haven't and you would like to donate, um, this is all put on by volunteers. Um, Laura and Tim give up their time and energy to um, put on and organize the cycle touring festival. So if you would like to make a donation, there's a big green button on the right hand side on all over the place on the cycle touring festival website. So please um, make a donation. Yep. Um, so Caroline um, at Verse Cycle is a writer of poetry, prose, fiction and non-fiction. Her poems range thematically from cycling, trying to be environmentally friendly. She's a, an eco warrior. Um, to love and heartbreak, which we all know, and depression and anxiety, which I'm sure lots of us have experienced flashes of over the last year. While her flash fiction short stories include comedy, speculative flick fiction and fairy tales. Her most recent poetry commission, Chatterton Rises, for Glenside Hospital Museum with Bristol Festival of Ideas, aims to challenge stereotypes associated with mental health, which is really exciting. She's um, featured in Warrington's Contemporary Art Exhibition 2020, published in the 2020 National Flash Fiction Day Anthology. Obviously, the Wilfred Owen Association Journal, we're going to be hearing much more about Wilfred, um, Cycle UK magazine, Bristol Festival of Ideas website, the Sunday Tribune, shortlisted for the Nature in the Air 2020 Poetry Competition and longlisted for the Penguin Right Now 2020. And not only that, but she features on loads of podcasts, the Sprocket podcast, Cycling Europe podcast, Bike Life, the Warm Showers um, Foundation Cycling Podcasts and on Spoken Label Poetry Podcasts and Poets Unplugged on Spotify. She's um, been a speaker at the Cycle Touring Festival before, running awesome workshops and the Spoken Explorers Connect. And she performed at the 2020 Lancaster Arts in the Park Virtual Festival. She's got an MA in Creative Writing, teaches poetry and creative writing workshops and regularly performs her work live. So without further ado, can everyone please give for a giant although slightly silent clap and I'll hand over to you Caroline thank you. Thank you Libby that's lovely. All right, I'm going to talk about uh, a Wilfred Owen bicycle tour I did in the north of England to start with and then I guess we'll have some questions about that and then I'll talk a bit about Bristol Bike Bard which is something I've been doing during lockdown to to try and get me out on my bike so if I start off with Wilfred Owen I often joke about Wilfred that I'm in love with a man who's over 100 years dead and forever young, but I'm being a bit flippant really because Wilfred's poems were the beginning of a love affair for me with poetry. And the reason is I think poetry shouldn't confuse its reader. Poetry gets a bit of a bad reputation sometimes or a scary reputation because it's been ruined by the way it's been taught in schools or has kind of high ideals sometimes. I don't think poetry should confuse its reader. And when it clearly and, clearly and concisely communicates something using the musicality and rhythm of rhyme, poetry can be incredible. And for me, it's Wilfred Owen's work, which is an example of this. So I moved up to Lancaster for a couple of years. And while I was there, I realized there were quite a few Wilfred Wilfred Owen locations that I could visit by bike. So I created a sort of mini bike tour called a Wilfred Owen Odyssey. So this is, I don't have this bike anymore, but um, this one's fully loaded with camping gear and two big panniers. Uh, and it was spring 2019, it was beginning of May. So I first off wobbled from Lancaster down to near Blackpool where my parents are. And then I set off properly the following day for Liverpool, which was my first port of call. So that ride from near Blackpool down to Liverpool was mostly lovely. There's the, the filed kind of flat farmlands filled with lambs at that time of year. Um, but if anyone up in the north, I know there's a couple of folk up in the northwest watching, you'll know that unfortunately all roads lead to Preston. There's no real getting around it. And Preston is not cyclist friendly at all. Uh, I think nearly everyone's trying to get out of it that's ended up in it. Apologies if you're in Preston. Um, it's one saving grace for me is usually even in Park which is a landscaped Victorian park just directly south of the train station. And usually there's a, a dedicated cycle route going through it to get 
to the south of the city, um, but it was under maintenance. So I was cycling around Avon and Park trying to find the least stressful way to continue my journey south. And it was uh, it was quite odd. A man could see that I was t- trying to figure out how to get out of the park and how to continue. And he called me over and gave me the most confusing amount of directions I think I've ever received, apart from one time in Glossop. And uh, he did this while holding really tightly to a genuine Rottweiler that he said didn't like cyclists. So I don't know why he called me over, but it, it was an interesting exchange anyway. But I got free of Preston. And this always kind of makes me laugh. It's a somewhat passive aggressive greeting to Leyland. It's a full size Centurion tank, which is World War II, not World War I, but Leyland as well as other vehicles used to produce tanks. So it's quite impressive, but somewhat strange. It always makes me kind of chuckle. And then I was back on pleasant country roads heading towards Liverpool. I didn't know Liverpool was home to so many iconic sports grounds. First off, I went past Aintree, which is where the Grand National happens. I didn't know that was there. And I'm not a football fan. So when I saw Everton, I was like, all right, that's in Liverpool. So um, the edge of Liverpool, Everton area, like any big city, the edges are usually a bit run down. So I didn't really want to get lost around there. And I was quite happy when I found a segregated bike lane as I got closer into the city centre. So Liverpool seemed to be creating some kind of room for cyclists. It's not perfect though, because I was on this bike lane, which was great until I needed to come off it to make a right turn, um, which is when a bus driver started honking and, and shouting at me for not being in the bike lane, but it wasn't going where I wanted to go. So the infrastructure's kind of getting there but not completely and again everyone's vying for space and it's it's not quite laid out as well as it could be um but my ride down to liverpool got me to the albert docks which is a really pretty kind of regenerated area there's big white pavements uh you can cycle on this is where all the museums and art galleries are and it's also where one of the youth hostels is, it's ideally located for that. So the there are two official youth hostels in Liverpool now, but the one down at the Albert Docks, it's got secure bike lockups outside. So it's really handy if you're a cyclist. Um, and hopefully once COVID ends, we can all start going to hostels and stuff again. So that was a 50 mile ride to kind of get me in place for the next day, where I wanted to get across the Mersey. So I saw about getting a ferry, but outside of commuting times, they only do a long scenic tourist route. And I only wanted to get across to Birkenhead. So the folks at the at the ferry terminal were really helpful and said this. At St. James, you can get a train under the Mersey. Um, the reason I wanted to get to Birkenhead was because that's where Wilfred Owen had lived from the age of seven where there was a Wilfred Owen Story Museum and also a newer statue named after Wilfred's poem, Futility. So I left the bike at the hostel for this and I went over to Hamilton Square, which is the name of the train station as well. Um, It's a really nice square. Um, There's an impressive cenotaph. I mean, it's always sad seeing uh, such a long list of names of those that have fallen in the Great War, but it's also quite a lovely uh, commemoration to them. So that's from 1925, that cenotaph went up. But I walked all around the square trying to find this new statue called Futility, and I I just couldn't locate it until I asked a man on a bench, and he said, "It's, it's a way over there on the corner opposite the square across the road. So... It's a bit tucked out the way, but it is on the corner. Um, And this is a a new statue. It's not of Wilfred Owen. It's named after Wilfred Owen's poem because of his association with the area. And it was commissioned for November 2018, so the 100th 100th year end of World War I. And it shows in bronze a soldier slumped sort of in despair it's by a local artist called Jim Whelan. 
and it's really quite I was really quite taken with it you can see in the in the right background there that's where the cenotaph is so it's sort of overlooking Hamilton Square and at the bottom of the statue there's a plaque which has got Wilfred Owen's futility poem printed on it and um, that poem tells it's called futility because it tells the story of a soldier who's frozen overnight in the trenches just from exposure and it's about a soldier from a farming background so if I read the first verse it goes move him into the sun gently its touch awoke him once at home whispering of fields half sown Always it woke him, even in France, until this morning in this snow. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old son will know. So the poem's talking about the futility of someone dying in a trench overnight, not even in battle. And I was told afterwards that certain military organisations weren't happy about the statue being put up at all with the claim Wilfred Owen had been a pacifist. And I've encountered this belief before, but it's false. Whatever your feelings about war or World War I or um, fighting, um, Wilfred Owen was a soldier and he was injured and sent home with shell shock, now known as PTSD. And he was awarded the Military Cross. But Wilfred Owen had the option to continue his army service on home soil but instead he chose to return to the front and that's where he was killed in action. And it was, it was Owen's anger at the propaganda of war, not the war itself, that was the subject of his poetry. And the aim of his poems was to com communicate the reality of what life was like for the soldiers. So it's like a lot of the, the war artists that were sent out at the time as well, um, with the government kind of hoping they'd come back with charges of the light brigade and that kind of scene and instead the artists started painting the reality like Paul Nash paintings that are just these apocalyptic scenes so the, the war poets were doing a similar thing but it would seem with this idea and the, the, the position of the statue that the propaganda machine is still very much operating but there was an ally to this statue. Um, Prince Harry and Meghan vis visited it. It was their first official visit in January 2019. So with them, they brought media attention to the statue, which I thought was a nice nod to it. Anyway, so I was also in Birkenhead because there was, round the corner, there was a Wilfred Owen Story Museum, an actual place dedicated to all things Wilfred. Uh, the museum's moved location now, it's still in the Wirral, but I went off there thinking it would be run by a small division of retired war veterans, but instead it was a former musician who'd also attended Birkenhead Institute that was running it. That's a model of what the school used to look like because it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and the man running it had put his musical skills into making a Wilfred Owen musical, so that was fab. The museum was... Uh, a mine of just curious information all about Wilfred's life and his time in the area. There were lovely photos of him with his three siblings. So there's Mary, Harold and Colin. Um, there was one of him with a toy boat. There's one of him dressed up as a toy soldier. And there he is as a young man before being a soldier. Um, and there was a fabulous, well, there's this all these fabulous things to do with Wilfred. But there was another little sort of trench scene by the same artist that had done the futility statue. So that's by Jim Whelan again. There was, in the area is Port Sunlight, which is was the home of Lever Brothers. And this is an example of some of the war propaganda going on at the time in World War I. So the soap advert makes the claim, I don't know if you can see it, but I'll read it. No one can pay too high a tribute to the bravery and efficiency of our gallant soldiers, the cleanest fighters in the world. So there's a reason to buy soap in 1914 to 18. Um, in a gas mask near that advert, it brought to mind to me the first Wilfred poem 
I'd ever read, which is the one a lot of people um, get taught in school. Uh, it's called Dulce et Decorum Est. It's a Latin title, which Wilford put as a direct challenge to the war propaganda at the time. Uh, the original Latin, ancient Latin poem quotes, uh, it translates as, it is sweet and brave to die for one's country. So that's what was being taught in schools. And in Wilfred's poem, what he graphically describes is how not sweet the effects of a horrific mustard gas attack is on, is on one soldier who's unable to get his mask on in time. There's a couple of lines I'll read. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs and it's a real sort of nightmare poem really depicting the reality of what was happening. And his poem finishes with, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. So in 1914, children were being taught the Horace poem, and nowadays people are more taught the Wilfred Owen poem. So it's quite interesting how that's changed. And it also kind of shows the power of words and how they can be used either side. The museum's owner was really kind and he offered to take me and Julie, another guest, for a quick tour to see some different houses where Wilfred and his family had lived. Um, where Tom, Wilfred's dad, had worked because his dad worked on for the railways. And that was a, just a, a lovely, unexpected bonus. So that was a full day of Wilfred in Barkinghead for me. Um, the next day I was back on the bike. So I was crossing the Mersey again, back at St. James Station with the heavily loaded bike um to go 50 miles further south to Oswestry, which was Wilfred Owen's birthplace in Shropshire Welsh borders so at the train station there was a big lift there were two lifts to get down to the actual platform and the first lift was great for the bike because I could get everything in and it was a big lift and the second lift was really problematic because it was tiny and I had to find I've got a bad back, so I find it quite hard to lift a fully loaded back, uh, bike. But I found a member of staff called Mark, and he was wonderful because he helped pack me and the bike in this really tiny lift with the bike lifted vertically. And, um, and he waited at the next level down to help unpack me and the bike from the lift. Uh, and on top of that, he used his radio across to the next stations to find out which of their lifts were big lifts all the way. So he found out instead of Hamilton Square, if I went to Conway Park, that I could get a big lift up to the street level again without any any kind of Jenga, human Jenga with the bike and the, the panniers. So he was also having a really nice chat with me about cycling because he uses his bike when he's on late and early shifts. So it's just the way the bike kind of communicates between people and opens up conversation in a, in a nice friendly way. So back up on the road, from the day before, I recognised Wilfred's house on Elm Grove with its blue plaque. So that was nice to see again. And then I was out heading towards Chester um, on woody back roads, really nice country lanes again, until that all ended abruptly on the A450, which is a massive, horrible racetrack towards Chester. But fortune was on my side. If you can see on the left of this Google map shot, there's a genuine proper cycling cafe. It's called Eureka. I think they should call it, thank God you're there. And um, it's been there for over 80 years. So I went inside uh, to get a calming coffee because this road was really horrible. And to get local knowledge about a different way to get into Chester. And as soon as I pulled my map out, I was surrounded. There was there were so many friendly, helpful cyclists with different possible routes. There was one down by the river. There was a bike path. There was a, a kind of more scenic route. So I was inundated. And then um, this one man called Roy he said, I'm going into Chester. I'll show you the way. So 
that was again just really nice cycling community um, and helpful people. And local knowledge is just uh, just the best way to find your way around, I think. So um, Roy made me laugh. I think he was the god of, of wheels because he told me he had 29 bikes, including the one he was riding. And he slowed his average speed from 22 miles per hour down to 12, which is what I was going at on that loaded bike. And he piloted me onto the traffic-free greenway, which is like a Sustrans route. Uh, and along the bike path, we went past the cemetery and he, he pointed and he said, biggest population in Chester. And it was filled with uh, Commonwealth war graves. So that was interesting to see. So I had a quick look around Chester's medieval walls and then I was back on country lanes. Now, I don't usually use... Um, GPS or anything, I use paper maps. So I was mostly using pages torn out of an old road map. And unfortunately, when I got to Eccleston, uh, all the roads ended by going into the River Dee and there was no way to get across. And what had been marked as a, a track road on this road map was actually securely gated behind the Duke of Westminster's Eaton Hall. Um, and there was no, there was nowhere else to go. So I buzzed the intercom on the off chance they might let me through, but they said no. It's a ten thousand hectare estate. It's huge. So I ended up having to go a really long way round because that was out of bounds. Um, but it didn't matter because I ended up at this another really nice uh, cycling friendly cafe. This one was decorated with lots of uh, bright bike prints. So you don't get, you, you find things by accident and they were lovely and helpful in there as well. Um, so after this, I was trying to head on to Oswestry. Street. The weather had been really fair up until now. It was, it was the beginning of May, it was spring, but after about this point, it, I was fully testing my waterproofs out. Um, it was it was really miserable for the second half of the day. And I got to near Oswestry, Street and I was wanting to go and see Hillfort, which I passed because it's a settlement since the Iron Age. And it's near where Wilfred spent his childhood. And it's also where he was camped during his army training in 1916 before he went to the front. But I was just so wet and soggy. I just kept going. But he wrote a good poem. And, well, he wrote all his poems are good. But he wrote a poem called Storm in 2016. And it's about a tree's relationship with lightning. Um, and he puts in that poem that the land shall freshen that was under gloom, which I think was true. Because after I finally reached my warm showers hosts, um, they helped lighten my mood and dry me out and help me recover from what had become a really soggy remainder of the ride. The whole that whole day was nine hours on the bike. It was a uh, it was a bit like traveling in 1914 or 16. Anyway, Duncan and Ollie were just lovely warm showers hosts, and um, they let me stay for two nights. So the next day I could go and see everything that Oswestry Street could show me about Wilfred Owen, which was a lot. So they first of all pointed me out to K Glass Park. I'm not sure the pronunciation, correct me please if necessary. Um, Wilfred was born in Oswestry in 1893. And although they left in 1900 to go to Birkenhead, I had a downloaded PDF town trail that sh showed how packed it was with Wilfred places. First off, there was another statue of Wilfred Owen. So this one also went up in 2018 to commemorate the 100 years since the end of World War I. And it's a life-size statue of Wilfred holding out this cascading stream of papers, um, which is on, inscribed on them as words from his poems and also little poems that local school children have made and written, and it's in the school children's hands. So there's bits of Dolce at Decorum Est and bits of Strange Meeting. And I liked one that this, this kid had written, which was 100 years since Wilfred Owen died, yet all his words are still alive. Um, 
And this statue is by Tim Turner, who's a local artist, and it's set beside this beautiful weeping willow tree. And I found it almost impossible to leave. I was quite taken with it, just the whole arrangement of it. But I did leave because there were so many places to go and see. So there was St. Oswald's Church where Tom and Susan, his parents were married and they had a bench there with two poems on it on a plaque. So there was Futility again, an anthem for doomed youth, uh, which was quite fitting to be outside a church. So that poem's got the lines, what passing bells for those who die as cattle, only the monstrous anger of the guns. Then I was on to Oswestry's Street's visitor centre, had a display upstairs and, up, and there they had sort of um, charting his, his writing and also letters to his mum uh, and images of war horses. And that was Plas Wilmot's where Wilfred was actually born. There's a blue plaque on the house, but I was too scared to run into the garden. Um, I just felt, I don't know, I just lost my bottle about running in and taking a picture. I have to go back. Um, but this was the family home where they lived with his grandparents. But when Wilfred's grandfather died, he left the family in financial ruin, which is why they had to pack up very quickly and then move to Birkenhead, um, where his dad had got work on the railways. There was also... Um, where where Tom had worked with the railways in Oswestry, Street. And there was even a Wilfred Owen Memorial Park with a play area. So it was full. I also went to the library because my leaflet said there was a Wilfred display there, but I couldn't find it. So I asked the librarian and she sat me down, went to a cupboard, unlocked it, and produced four huge ring binders full of Wilfred information and clipping so that was amazing so I sat down for ages looking through all of that and then the librarian was called Lou she came back with a tin of leftover flapjacks from a natter and chatter group for me to eat and then she showed me this wonderful picture on her phone so Oswestry had a local bake-off competition and Lou made a Wilfred Owen poppy and lemon seed cake so it was just Wilfred Owen amazing in Oswestry. Street. Uh, she told me she got second place. Um, after that, I went and had a coffee overlooking the Wilfred statue back in the park. And then back at, oh, back at my warm showers hosts, uh, Duncan and Ollie's daughter was just about to start being a music student at uni. So she showed me a video of a Kate Bush song I didn't know called Army Dreamers, which again tells the story of a young man being shipped home dead to his parents from the army so there was everyone had something to kind of share or tell me about Wilfred Owen or connected information it was amazing um so so far I've stayed in a youth hostel and warm showers but I've got all my camping equipment on the bike um it wasn't redundant it's because my Wilfred Owen tour was taking a three-night break because I was off in the opposite wrong direction for Wilfred to go to the Mahonless Comedy Festival, which is a very different theme to tracing the World War I poetry of um, Wilfred Owen. But it was a nice little detour. It's beautiful cycling around that way. But I have never been so cold in a tent in my life. It was the beginning of May and the tents were freezing with ice at night and I was putting cardboard boxes from the co-op underneath the floor of my tent to try and insulate it. I was doing crunches in my sleeping bag when I woke up shivering. And I think reading Futility probably didn't help because I was, I was genuinely wondering if it's possible to die of hypothermia in Wales in May. But uh, it was beautiful during the daytime. It was a great festival. Um, so I recovered by... Uh, continuing on the next day, 35 miles to Abermule to a little B&B that had central heating. Um, and that was a lovely route because I was, I was starting to make my way back to Wilfred Owen. So I was heading towards Shrewsbury. So Abermule was kind of the midpoint. 
and uh, it was it was up through hills. There was really tiny lanes, so I had to keep waiting with cars. We were taking turns at passing places. And at one point, the road got blocked because a lorry was unloading into a field. So I was stood by a, an elderly lady out walking with our daughter. And all of these cows were unloaded into the field. And the cows were screaming and running around. It was really disturbing. And the mum told me it's because they'd been separated from their calves. And then another truck came along that had the calves in them. So I'd never seen anything like that. I usually live in cities. So that was um interesting and also a bit scary because the cows seem so unhappy um but then it was into shrewsbury it was it was grand weather apart from the freezing cold and the absolute torrential rain on the way to oswe street it was great weather so shrewsbury um had another really good guide for me called shropshire war walks so these are all pdfs online um there was no missing signs for Shrewsbury Abbey and right beside the road on the grass there they had a board with a Wilfred Owen poem on it which is called Strange Meeting and that's a really disturbing poem. Uh, it tells the story of a soldier who finds himself in the trenches of hell and he meets a soldier he's killed and then realizes that he's also dead and their situations are mirrored and part of that poem reads I am the enemy you killed, my friend. I knew you in this dark, for so you frowned yesterday through me as you jabbed and killed. I parried, but my hands were loath and cold. Let us sleep now. So the opposing sides of the soldiers are kind of united in this underworld that they've both ended up in. The rest of the plaque had information to do with another sculpture called Symmetry. And this is a sculpture of a pontoon bridge by an artist called Paul de Monchot. And that was put in place in 1993 to commemorate 100 years since Wilfred Owen's birth. It's got quotes from Strange Meeting on it. And the reason it's a pontoon bridge is because it represents the pontoon bridge that Wilfred Owen and the soldiers were trying to construct over the Sombre Canal when he was killed in France. So I, I had my guide and off I went on my bike to go and take more pictures of my bike outside various Wilfred Owen houses. So there was this one, Wilmot House on Cannon Street. So it's named like Plas Wilmot where he was born. There was his other grandparents' house, Hawthorne Villas on Underdale Road, uh, another on Cleveland Street, and one called Mahim on Monkmore Road. So this one had a blue plaque and it's called Mahim because Tom's dad named it after um, his time working on the railways in India. So because it had a blue plaque, it actually got a photo of me and my bike in this one. So I asked a, a man that was passing by, can you take my photo? And he was quite young. He was about 20-ish. But when I told him about my quest, why I wanted the photo, it turned out I'd stopped another Wilfred Owen fan. And he said, oh, you must go to Oxford University Library. They've got lots of Wilfred Owen's letters to his mum there. So there's more places for me to visit. And I just, I just loved it. It was Wilfred again, kind of connecting everyone. I circled back to the Abbey, left my bike in the doorway. And inside there were, there was a counter with some mementos to buy. And behind the counter, there was the huge stone tablet. And on that, it said, in memory of those officers and men of this parish who fell in the Great War, and on its list was included the name Lieutenant W.E.S. Owen, M.C. Manchester Regiment. So Wilfred died aged 25 on the 4th of November 1918. And that's exactly one week before the armistice. His nephew, Peter Owen, said that on the 11th of November, when Shrewsbury Abbey's bells were ringing that the war was over, that's when the telegram arrived, which told Wilfred's parents he'd been killed. So even though I knew how this story ended, I cycled to my lodgings above a pub, feeling somewhat 
alone and sad on this depressing note. In his own words, Wilfred Owen said that he wrote about the pity of war and I'd set out on my little bike tour to try and discover more about his writing and his poignant history. But what I actually found out about on top of that were his letters to his mother and his dad's railway job moving them around, the places where he and his siblings had grown up, and all of that brought to, brought to life a man who was over 100 years dead, and it made him much more than the soldier and the poet for me. And I hadn't ever really been alone either, as well as Wilfred metaphorically being with me. I'd met a ridiculous amount of fellow enthusiasts, and his, his name always sparked smiles in people who wanted to share how Wilfred Owen had somehow affected them or the poems they'd learned about him or anything that was associated with him. So there were student musicians to librarians and statues to poppy seed cakes. And I just loved what that adventure, mini adventure gave me. So in the B&B that last evening, I found on YouTube Richard Burton reading the Wilfred Owen poems and I rested my bones in the bath while listening to that. And then when I got home, I wrote a poem about my adventure. So I'll try and find you that poem now. If you bear with a middle-aged woman trying to use technology, I'll find the video. So the video is a poem called A Wilfred Owen Odyssey. It's based on the structure of a Wilfred Owen poem called Spring Offensive. Uh, but this poem is called A Wilfred Owen Odyssey, A Spring Cycling Offensive. And it sort of sums up everything I've said in this talk. So. This poem's called A Wilfred Owen Odyssey, A Spring Cycling Offensive by Caroline Burroughs. My bike's fully loaded, my own pack mule, a pilgrimage of Wilfred Owen poetry, riding south between the Pennines and the Irish Sea, I set my sights for distant Liverpool. You can't miss it, says a man, I ask for directions. Casting his curse, I get lost different ways. Till I skirt Leyland, where tanks were once made. I'm relieved I've survived it through Preston. Spring lambs bounce around flat fields in the ribble, near two crows ganging up on a baby squirrel. The bee road takes me over six screaming lanes to a scouse bus honking with offensive disdain. In Birkenhead, a statue called Futility shows a man with his head in his hands who sat with a wreath of paper poppies in his lap. The bronze remains dull, although it's sunny. Expecting a veteran, I meet a musician who went to the B.I. Wilfred's old school. Only a wall remains where a cruel head caned kids for breaking archaic rules. In his Wilfmobile, he shows me locations. Did you know a dead famous poet lived there? The people living inside couldn't care. Then it's back to the Wilfred Owen Museum, hearing how he's adapted poetic rhythm into a Wilfred Owen musical. Near Chester, I rest in a cyclist cafe, where a roadie shows me a safer greenway, past the cemetery where rows of soldiers fill, uniform graves standing to attention. Despite the forecast, there's miles of cold, wet stuff, but warm showers greet me at Oswestry from members of that cycling community. There's Will's birthplace, another statue, an exhibition, a plaque, a park in the church where he prayed. A Wilfred lemon and poppy seed cake was made by the librarian, second place in a bake-off. I wait by a country field as cows are unloaded. One runs bellowing. It's separated, and another truck is its baby calf. It's quieter when I reach city grass outside Shrewsbury Abbey, whose bells when they were ringing war's end. That's when Wilfred's mum got news he died. At a pub B&B, &B, I stop cycling. In the bath, the acoustics sound great being read. 
Wilfred Owen by Richard Burton on YouTube before bed. There's been so many lovely comments. I don't know if you've seen them as you've been going through, Caroline, but so many um, people really moved by, and it, including me, just really moved by your passion for, for Wilfred. And just, it's really lovely to see that combined with a bicycle tour and just hear about all the amazing people that you met. And as Paul said, love the haphazard path of your journey. It's just <laughs> absolutely beautiful. But um, I'm not sure if we've got any questions, just lots of love for what you're saying. So maybe a bit more, please. OK. All right, then. So uh, I will I'll, let me screen share again. All right. So the next the next thing I'll, I'll touch on is um, I was up in Lancaster until last September and then I moved back to Bristol where I'd lived before, uh, just in between lockdowns. So. Whether Bristol wanted one or not, I pronounced myself Bristol Bike Bard. Um, it was it was more of a way to kind of entertain myself. Um, what I'd been doing up in Lancaster is I'd spent a year writing a verse a day about trying to be environmentally friendly and how difficult it is a lot of the time. And you do one thing right and then you do five things wrong. So I called it It's Not Easy Being Green. And I sort of wrote a verse a day for a year about trying to do that. And it's, it's sort of turned into a diary as well, not just about trying to be eco-friendly. But that finished in mid-September. So I thought when I finished that, I'd be really happy and relieved to not be writing a verse of poetry every single day. But only about a week went past and the habit was so firmly entrenched by then that I actually missed it so when I got back to Bristol I thought I'll, I'll start it again I'll, I'll do it writing about Bristol about cycling around the city um, and I found it really beneficial just for me as a, a sort of personal project um, especially during lockdown part three the worst trilogy ever um, because it encourages me to get out the house on my bike. And because I, I spend a lot of time writing, I'm by default in the house on a laptop a lot of the time anyway. Uh, so it encourages me to get outside. Um, it's also really made me appreciate Bristol in a way that I probably took for granted the first time I lived here because I'm noticing little things and odd historical places and funny street names and things that I hadn't, the scene before when I was just, you know, working and going to and from work and caught up in sort of non-lockdown life. And uh, I also, like, I mean, we said at the beginning, I'm writing stuff for Glenside Hospital Museum, but I, I struggle with um, anxiety and depression. So just anything that makes me get out on the bike, even if it's only for 10 minutes to look at a nice sunset, does me good because um, social isolation is really bad. And not recommended if you have mental health struggles, but then that's what's recommended for lockdown. So I don't have to go out on the bike far. I don't have to go out for long, but just going out benefits sort of my mind, body and soul. So I started this on the 1st of October. I'm not doing it every single day. I'm giving myself rest days where needed or when broadband breaks down, which has happened twice. Um, for some reason, I've decided to make it harder by choosing to write in Terza Rima, which is a, a, a rhyming structure that connects to the verse before and after. So they do all connect. It's um, it's what Dante wrote, Circles of Helen, which is what I've kind of set up for myself. But um, yeah, I've got I'm up to verse ninety two now. I'm not. Don't worry, I'm not going to show you all of them. So I've just been posting these on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook as standalone. So there's uh, Thomas Chatterton's in Millennium Square, a statue of him, um, which is what Bristol was celebrating last year. There's a amazing, on the Bristol Bath bike path at Warmley, there's an actual TARDIS that is a toilet. Um, so it's things like that. It's just little magical little things to find in a local area. There's, if anyone ever drives through or past Bristol, they usually go past the big yellow house on the M32. It's the Dower House, and it's a little sort of oasis of greenland flanked by quite in, quite urban um, city areas. So 
and uh, it's just little touches as well like the little local bike shop they've got the front of the door is blocked off but they've got handlebars at the front of the door and a bell to ring for service so there's just always something to see or look at or do uh, me and my housemate made a Christmas cog tree with super glue and old bits of bike so um, I always find ways to entertain myself that's a little collection of cycling figures so I've started putting those together in blocks of 20 as videos and they've all gone up on YouTube today so that's one of the other endeavours that I've been doing that's the most recent one when the Perseverance rover landed on Mars two nights ago, three nights ago. Uh, so I found it quite interesting that I was I was from a little folding bike looking up at the moon and Mars was an orange speck just above the moon. It looks like a star, but it's, it's Mars. And I thought, oh, God, there's a little rover up there that's maybe looking down at us. So this is that's one of the other things that I've been doing, combining cycling with poetry. Uh, let me come out of screen share. I think stop share. I love it. I want to hear more about the Bristol stuff. Um, lots of love for your little cyclist gnomes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the little um, there's a little French uh cyclist. There's a in in Brittany. There's a little uh famous granny that's always out on a motorbike or a cycle cartoon. So um, that, she's one of the little cyclists and a little. Smurf cyclist as well. I got to the 2012 Olympic Games from the one of the embassies was showing the cycling. Belgium, that was it. Yeah, but because have you so done any um any photo shoots with your little figures around Bristol? Uh no, but I'm happy to if you if you want to start a project doing that, we can do rant. <laughs> do it and write poems about it. Wouldn't that be super fun? <laughs> yeah, that would be good fun. That would be good fun. There's um, a Japanese artist, I can't remember what um, they're called, but there was this book I bought years and years ago, and it's about these, makes these huge scenes with those tiny little figures. So we'll make like a, you know, a small puddle or something into like this yeah. huge thing. That would be really fun. I think we should do something cool like that and do like, a presentation on it next year. I'm more than happy to do that. There's someone that's done things like that with Star Wars figures, which is also really cool. Like little stormtroopers building a um, Christmas tree. Uh, which is oh I like this idea yeah I think we should we should um have some good rambling maybe not when everyone else has to listen um right I've got some questions for you if that's okay um mm -hmm. lots of people saying they're going to check out your poetry on YouTube and oh can you read one final poem so we definitely need um a, another reading I've just popped um oh I hope I have this um chat thing's a bit naughty um I've just popped um Caroline's social media details again in the chat thing so um, please copy and paste everything that I've just stuck in there so you can have a look at her afterwards check it all out um, Rob wanted to know if you've got any other verse based trips planned uh, what bef just before I left Lancaster last year I was originally planning to try and cycle up to Scotland to, to, to see friends but all the localised lockdowns were shutting down my route so I ended up uh, before I left Lancaster, tracing the Lancashire rip, uh, the Lancashire Witches route from 1612, where there's 10 poetry stones are laid out with a verse on each of them by Carol Ann Duffy, the former poet laureate. So it's from near where the cycle test, cycle festival, blew it, where it's near where the cycle festival's held in Waddle Hall near Clitheroe in Barrowford is where... Uh, the Lancashire witches in 1612 was a was a big group of witches, including the Pendle witches. They weren't obviously witches; they were people accused of witchcraft. Um, so I traced this route because it was a small sort of 50 mile from home ride. I could get home should, if lockdowns really came into force again back in September up there. So I'll probably I've written about it, but I'll probably write a poem about tracing the route that these. Um, men and women were made to walk from near Clitheroe to Lancaster, where they were then held in the castle, which was the jail before being hung up on Gallows Hill. It was the biggest one. It was the biggest uh, amount of people killed for witchcraft in the UK, a bit like the Salem witches in the USA. So I'll probably write something about that. Um, on YouTube this morning, if it worked, it was scheduled to go up with four batches of the Bristol Bike Bard verses so there's stuff up on that and 
if lockdown ends and get vaccinated and things like that, what I'd really love to do is is go cycle touring around the UK and find the local poet, either dead or alive or both from that area and sort of see how they wrote poetry and what they wrote poetry about and then write about that adventure. Um, I spoke to Andrew Sykes about this and one of his really, uh, his Cycling Europe podcast, which are really cool. We're talking about Simon Armitage, the current poet laureate who did a thing walking along the Pennine Way and then wrote about it. I know I'm not Simon Armitage, but um, I'd like to do something similar with poetry, tracing tracing the roots of poets. I did something similar to do with books, and that's on YouTube. I, I gave a talk at uh, the Cycle Tour and Festival before about a literary cycling tour of the North from Jania to Dracula. So that was tracing the route of, of books I'd read when I did my undergrad with the Open University. So I'm sort of always... I talk about living a sort of virtual reality where I go off and write these routes, but really I'm with Hath, um, Kathy and Heathcliff on on the moors. Or That's with amazing. Both of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I live in my kind of head a lot of the time. As, well, that's most- fabulous, though, because that's what I feel like that's what, you know, we should be doing in, in lockdown is exploring kind of closer to, well, obviously exploring closer to home and it fits with the kind of environmentally friendly thing as well. I know you've been on um, on a real push to kind of get life um, you know much more in in line with being environmentally friendly but also just to you know to really dig a bit deeper and and research things that you've grown up loving like literature and and poetry is so amazing um we've got a couple of comments popping up here um Eleanor said that her husband's grandfather published his first world war poetry Eleanor get in touch oh, get in touch yeah. with yeah. her eyes light yeah. up yeah, get in touch with her because I'm sure she'd love to hear about it. Oh, you can think laureates from Duffy to Armitage. That would be really cool. Yeah. Oh, if, if anyone can put um, posts on the Cycle Tour and Festival Facebook page or something, I'd really love to see that. Yeah. Yeah, or maybe if so underneath um, where this will go on the Facebook group, if anyone's got any comments for Caroline, please pop them in there if you don't ask a question right now. Um, Raluca said she um, loves the concept cycling along the city and writing poetry. Do you mind if they nick the concept for where they are, which is pretty awesome, I'm guessing. Yeah, I think, I think more people write in poetry. Um, Fantastic. Another a guy from Bristol, I think it was a Bristol CTC Facebook page said, can I write a poem about cycling? I was like, yeah, the more of us, the better. Yeah, definitely. Um, oh, that's really great. It's good to hear it all spreading. When I started my um, trying to be it's, it's Not Easy Being Green endeavour, I was trying to only buy things that were secondhand rather than new. So I bought a bike trailer uh, a carry freedom trailer secondhand off a man on eBay and it was recommended by the Handlebards which is a cycling Shakespearean trip they yes. tour by bike they're fab course. yeah um but when I told this man called Dave on Facebook why I was buying the trailer um he'd had the bike trailer for cycle touring and climbing the three peaks I think so he was carrying his equipment on it he sent me the delivery note from the parcel company but he wrote it as a verse as a poem and it was just I just thought oh my god this is amazing if everyone communicates in poetry rhyming words that would just be such a a a real bonus to each day you know wouldn't it so that's that's the next challenge then so if someone has not only got a comment for Caroline but can make it into a poem on the Facebook group (laughs) um Dawn also said your Jane Eyre talk was the first talk she saw at the Cycle Touring Festival and it was brilliant you set the bar very high Oh, thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. Yeah, it was an early start. I was glad to, yeah, kick it off and get it done and get the nerves out of the way. Yeah. So, um, Caroline, everyone has really enjoyed um, hearing you. And I think we'd all love to hear a bit more of you and poetry, if if you don't mind. I know you've got something up your sleeve. Uh, I could show you. Right. OK, so let me try and screen share again. This is about... When I moved to Bristol the first time, the very first time I met Bristol CTC to go for a bike ride, um, they'd arranged to go to Tintin Abbey, which is over in Wales. And I was so excited because it's it's William Wordsworth wrote a poem about Tintin Abbey that I'd studied. So I was super duper excited about this little, another little pilgrimage to a kind of poetry place, but it did not work out quite as planned. 
Tintern Abbey Lines composed quite a few miles away at a garden centre in Chepstow. A blank verse poem by Caroline Burroughs I sought out romantic enlightenment to create, like Wordsworth, a spot of time, as writing Tintern Abbey did for him, where his poem recorded a snapshot to think back on fondly in future times. I studied Will's poem the night before my first ride out with Bristol CTC, planning to cycle to that same abbey. Wild gothic images formed in my mind, me on a sublime epic adventure, to ruins amongst lush dramatic hills. The cyclists met at a water tower, from England we battled cold driving rain, over the old Seven Bridge, winds joined us, screaming through its two huge white tuning forks. Once across we sheltered in a tunnel, in which a spray-painted cartoon dragon welcomed us to Wales, Croeso y Cymru. The bikes club's bigwigs held a committee, clawed, wet, gloved fingers were raised in favour to abstain, only my digit against. Tintern Abbey's ruins were abandoned. The vote? Visit Chepstow Garden Centre. Potted plants framed that sanitised landscape. Our soggy arses sat in its cafe. I grumpily cradled a large latte, devoured a cherry and almond slice. As we all warmed up, my mood lightened too. The seeds of new friendships germinated, opening up wider my narrow view. The result, a spot of time memory, surpassing academic pretensions, different roads to the same destination. Okay, so I've I've got some really good friends from Bristol CTC now. So <clears throat> not seeing Tintin Abbey. I saw it eventually another time. Oh, I can listen to your voice forever. You've got such a beautiful accent, and it's it lends itself so well to just the kind of lyrical passage of poetry. It's just I could listen to it all day. Um, thank you so so much, Caroline. It's been such. Um, a really eye-opening thing. I think um, last year, I mean, I, I kind of um, tour, cycle tour with a purpose, and I think it brings such an added depth to um, to a bike ride. And um, last year, oh, what's the lady called? Oh, the person who did, she oh, did this amazing talk, and it was um, all about her and her partner had done um, a tour of like lighthouses and I think it's such a nice thing to have like a really cool um you know a, like a cool theme and um idea for a tour so it's been really wonderful hearing about about all your poetry and you know just your love of Wilfred um it's yeah it's really amazing thank you so much for sharing that with all of us today and um yeah a massive thank you if anyone's got any questions for Caroline or um indeed a poem or any such thing that would be really great in you one of the festival there was a guy touring micro pubs <laughs> there's a theme <laughs> i think that would be a popular tour that one i'm pretty sure graham and um a whole bunch like alice and a whole bunch of people they they toured whiskey distilleries did they not oh. a theme can be anything it's right yeah. It's, it's, it can be it's so nice because you can go cycling just for the love of cycling and, and wanting to do the yeah. miles and the hills or you can combine it uh, other ways it's it's so variable what you can do with a bike it's it's open to anything it's great yeah it is well thank you ever so much for your time thank you everyone for joining us